It's uh, good to see you here this morning. And whether you're a visitor or a regular person who is attending here uh, on a regular basis, we want to welcome you to join us as we study God's Word, as we uh, sing songs of praise and worship, as we remember the Lord in the breaking of the bread, and as we have a time of fellowship afterwards. Welcome to everyone. Today, as you know, we uh, begin our study in the short letter of, uh, that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Philippi was the first city in Europe in which a church was planted. This is modern-day Turkey, which is in Asia, and this is modern-day Greece, which is in Europe. And our city, Philippi, is located here, and um, it's on, it has a control, physical control of the plain of Datos, um, which is a large, uh, fertile alluvial uh, plain in central Macedonia in northern Greece. It's located astride the Ignatian Way. That's the line you see in red here, which is a Roman highway that led from east to west. And it's about 10 miles inland from Neapolis, which is modern-day Kavala in Greece. Philippi was originally known as Crenides, which means the little fountains, because in that area there were many springs. It's also near some mountains which had gold uh, in them and gold mines, so the combination of rich farmland and gold mines made this a very desirable and strategic location. The city was renamed uh, Philippi by Philip II of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great, after he conquered the region in 400 BC. In the second century BC, Philippi became part of the Roman province of Macedonia. And then in 42 BC, we're zeroing in on our time frame, in 42 BC, the forces of Anthony and Octavian, who later became Caesar Augustus, defeated the forces of Brutus and Cassius, who were the assassins of Julius Caesar, at a battle in the alluvial plain just to the south and west of our city, Philippi. This battle marked the end of the Roman Republic and marked the beginning of the Roman Empire. After that battle, Philippi was granted the status of a Roman colony, which is very significant. And many of the veterans, uh, many veterans and many Italian farmers moved there and settled there. As a colony, Philippi ruled itself. It was not subject to the local Roman provincial government. It had the same rights as a city in Italy, including the use of Roman law, exemption from some taxes, and Roman citizenship, most importantly, Roman citizenship for its residents. This was a source of great pride for the residents who used Latin as their official language, who adopted Roman customs and dress, and modeled their city government after the cities in Italy. I read estimates of the population of Philippi in our time frame that we're interested in of being somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people. And that's in the middle part of the first century AD when Paul visited there in 48 or 49 AD. Now we hear the story and we understand the story in Acts 15, the account of how the gospel came from Asia to Europe in Paul's first visit to Philippi on his second missionary journey. Paul and Silas and Timothy, along with Luke, had passed through Phrygia and Galatia in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, on the Asian side, and the Holy Spirit did not permit them to preach the gospel there or to go into Bithynia, which is another region in that same area. So they came down to Troas, which is on the coast. And Acts 16 explains, a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a certain man of Macedonia, that's over in Greece, right? 
a certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So they went. And they came to Philippi. And when they got to Philippi, they went to a riverside outside the city to a place of prayer. Apparently, the Jewish population in the city was relatively small because in order to have a synagogue, they didn't go to the synagogue, they went to the place of prayer. In order to have a synagogue, there had to be 10 men who were heads of households to establish a synagogue. So either there weren't enough Jews in the city or because of the Roman customs were hostile to Christianity, they didn't let them, um, to Judaism, they didn't let them build a synagogue. Don't know for sure. But either way, the, the next level down would be a place of prayer, which is the place that Paul went to. And when Paul went to that place of prayer, he met several devout women. Among that group of women was Lydia, a merchant woman who was a seller of fine purple fabrics, who was from Thyatira over in Asia. And she was a worshiper of God. And the scripture says the Lord opened her heart. And she became a believer. She and all the household that she had, she was apparently a wealthy woman, she and all her household household believed and they were all baptized and she prevailed upon Paul and his companions to come to her house so they did one day they were going out to the place of prayer and <laughs> would you bring me that one day they were going out to the place of prayer and a slave girl who was possessed with a spirit of divination uh, who brought her owner's good profit by fortune telling followed Paul and his team and repeatedly cried out these men are servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation that's the truth isn't it even the demons know But she did this day after day, and it finally annoyed Paul so much that he commanded this spirit in Jesus' name to come out of her immediately, and it did. That very moment. The slave owners saw that their opportunity for profit was gone, which uh, annoyed them to no end. So they seized Paul and Silas, and they brought them to the authorities. Then the chief magistrates accused them of throwing the city into confusion and proclaiming unlawful customs for Romans. So the crowd rose up and came against Paul and Silas. The magistrates arrested them, stripped them, and beat them with rods. And after the severe beating, they threw them into the inner prison and chained their feet. At about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing, and all the prisoners were listening. Suddenly an earthquake happened, and the doors popped open, and all their chains fell off. I just don't know how it, an earthquake could make chains fall off, but it did. The jailer woke up, and he saw what had happened, and he supposed... The doors were open. He supposed everybody had escaped. So he drew his sword and he was preparing to kill himself when Paul said to him, everyone's still here. The jailer came and threw himself at the feet of Paul and Silas and he said to them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved you and your household. Can I just stop right here and say that the gospel is not complicated? 
The jailer asked, what do I need to do to be saved? Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord being a key word. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Salvation is by grace. It's unearned, it's unmerited, it's undeserved. And it is through faith, by believing. And it is simple. The jailer washed Paul and Silas' wounds and bound them. And they spoke God's word to all the jailer's household. Apparently the jail and the house were uh, pretty close. And everyone in the household also believed. They all ate midnight snack, I guess, or post-midnight snack. It had to be three or four in the morning by this time. They ate and the jailer's whole household rejoiced greatly because they had believed in God. At daybreak, the magistrates uh, sent a message to the jailer uh, to release Paul and Silas. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison. And now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The chief magistrates were afraid when they found out that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came personally and they brought them out and begged them to leave. And after, after stopping, stopping by Lydia's villa and encouraging the brethren there, they left Philippi down the Ignatian Way to Thessalonica. The Philippian believers more than once collected money and sent it to Paul to support him and his team as they traveled about teaching and sharing the gospel. This letter a friendship and exhortation was written some 12 or 13 years later in 61 or 62 AD. By that time, Paul was under arrest in Rome, a house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier. And when the Philippian church heard about it, they did again what they had done at the beginning. They collected and sent to him a gift of money. Epaphroditus, a respected brother in Philippi, brought their gift, and having come to Rome, he decided to stay there in Rome to help Paul in his imprisonment. But Epaphroditus got sick, so sick that he almost died. But mercifully, God raised him back up to health again, and Paul sent this letter of thanksgiving with Epaphroditus when he returned to Philippi. This short letter from Paul to the church in Philippi is personal and affectionate. And it reveals that this congregation had a special place in Paul's heart. As we read it, we can detect a very tender, a tender bond that existed between the apostle and this church that he had founded on the very edge of Europe. Now, looking at the letter, we see that this letter contains very little historical matter. The only real exception to that might be Paul's autobiography of his spiritual history. In chapter 3, verses 4 to 7, he explained his spiritual upbringing. But even this statement was couched in an exhortation. He told them not to rely on the flesh and to beware of people who relied on their own righteousness to get to God. You see, this is a letter of friendship and exhortation. Also, um, unlike Ephesians or Galatians, which we have just gone through, this letter to Philippi contains very little uh, theological instruction. There's one notable exception. And that is Paul's description of Christ's humiliation and exaltation. And this passage in chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, contains some of the most profound and crucial teaching on the Lord Jesus in the entire Word of God. Let me read it aloud to you. Since letters like this were intended 
to be read aloud. One person reading it to the entire group. Not all the group would necessarily be literate. And they would have to have the letter read to them. So this letter, Greco-Roman letters of friendship, were intended to be read aloud. So just listen. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. Wow. What wonderful theological instruction. But even this instruction was written in the context of an exhortation. Did you catch that? In verse 5, it said, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. This was an exhortation to imitate Christ. Even in the midst of difficulty and trouble, even in the midst of the resistance and suffering they were experiencing in Philippi, this was a letter of friendship and exhortation. And following the thread of the theme of being like Christ or imitating Christ, we see that Paul himself was committed to this in chapter 3, verse 8, he wrote, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And then in verse 10, he wrote, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul wanted more than anything else to know Christ, and to be like Christ. And he called the Philippians to join in following my example. Christ-likeness, being like Christ, is a significant theme in this letter. Another major theme is joy. Joy is how believers who know Christ and whose future is guaranteed by Christ, respond to difficulties and troubles, hardship, persecution. Not because they like to suffer. Everyone who likes to suffer, just raise your hand. See? Not because they like to suffer, but because their joy is in the Lord. Joy is not only or even primarily a feeling. It is an activity. Joy is about how a person thinks and about a person's attitudes. Joy is vocalized in our speech and it is expressed in our singing. Joy is the distinctive mark of the follower of Christ. And in this letter, joy appears often as an imperative, a command, an instruction. Joy and rejoice are mentioned 16 times in this short letter. And let me just tell you about some of those citations. Paul offered his prayer for them with joy. In chapter 1, verse 4. He rejoiced when Christ was proclaimed, even if the person proclaiming Christ did it with the wrong motive. We see that in chapter 1, verse 18. Paul invested himself in the Philippians' progress and in their joy, verse 25. 
Coming to chapter 2 in verse 17, he said that his joy would be complete if they were united, loving, humble, and unselfish. Paul rejoiced that he could suffer for their faith and told them about his joy in chapter 2, verse 17. And let me just show you those two verses because joy in verses 17 and 18 is mentioned four times in two sentences. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. And you too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me too. Then in verse 28 of the same chapter, we see that Paul sent Epaphroditus back to them, no longer sick, so that they would rejoice. And he instructed them in verse 29 to receive Epaphroditus with joy. Then in chapter 3, he commanded them to rejoice in the Lord. And coming to chapter 4, we see that Paul called them his joy and crown in verse 1. And looking at, and look at this imperative in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Joy. Even in the midst of trouble, Paul had it. And he wanted the Philippian believers to have it. Joy is how believers who know Christ and whose futures are guaranteed by Christ, respond to the difficulties of this present life. We see that joy is a major theme in this letter of friendship and exhortation. Another major theme in this letter is the gospel. And specifically, the cooperative participation the Philippian church and Paul shared in the proclamation and spread of the gospel. Eleven times the gospel or faith is mentioned in this letter. The content of the gospel, however, is not discussed very much. This is a letter of friendship and exhortation, not a letter of teaching. In Chapter 1, verse 5, Paul referred to their participation in the gospel from the beginning of their relationship. In verse 12, he affirmed that his imprisonment in Rome had turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And then in verse 16, he affirmed that he was appointed for the defense of the gospel. In chapter 1, verse 25, he referred to their progress and joy in the faith. And then he exhorted them to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel and to stand firm in unity, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The gospel and their sharing with him in the advance of the gospel is a major theme in this letter. Okay. Okay. Let's turn to our passage. 22 minutes of introduction that has to, that has to t top out my chart of longest introductions. But good for you, fortunately for you, there's only two verses in our text. Let's read it. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul began the letter uh, with his name, following the custom of letters of his day. He wrote the entire letter in the first person singular. Yet he included Timothy in his introduction, in the salutation. Perhaps Timothy was his secretary who wrote down what Paul dictated. Timothy was one of Paul's closest associates. 
And Paul spoke of him often with great affection and warmth. In this letter, in chapter 2, verse 22, Paul wrote about Timothy, but you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. From Paul's perspective, Timothy was a rare example of the Christ-like humility that he spoke of in his description of Christ that we read just a little bit ago. Notice that Paul did not refer to himself as an apostle. He did that in other cases, but in this case, he did not refer to himself as an apostle. But along with Timothy, he referred to himself and Timothy as bondservants of Christ Jesus. Paul and Timothy were slaves. That's what this word means, doulos, slaves of Jesus. In saying this, he described their total subjection to Christ Jesus, who is Lord of all and who was their Lord. I think Paul's reasoning here is quite simple. If Jesus is Lord, then we are his slaves. When one is a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a place of unparalleled honor. And they can be assured that their service, whatever its nature, is of supreme value because it's done for him. The Lord Jesus Christ. And thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is his given name. Um, It translates a Hebrew name, Yeshua. And that name means Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves. In Luke, the angels introduced him as Savior, Soter, Savior. Christ is Jesus' title, so to speak. It means anointed one and it refers to him as the Messiah. He fulfilled all the expectations in the Old Testament for the one sent from God, the Messiah. And Lord, the Greek word is kurios, is what Jesus is. He is Lord. Kurios, Lord, and Savior, Soter. Every tongue of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will ultimately confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me just tell you, timing matters, folks. Because everyone, every angel, every created being, every person will ultimately confess Jesus is Lord. If you confess Jesus is Lord in this life, you will be saved. If you wait until the afterlife and you are forced to confess him as Lord at that time, you will spend eternity separated from him. Timing. Confess Jesus as Lord now while you have breath. Note that Paul referred to Jesus three times in this introduction. In the entire letter, he referred to Jesus 55 times. Jesus' name or pronouns indicating his name. But here in the introduction, Paul said that he and Timothy were slaves of Jesus Christ, that the letter was written to the Philippian church who were in Jesus Christ, and Paul's blessing involved grace and peace from Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to make a note here, and it explains to me perhaps why the Philippian church was being troubled by their surrounding community. They were being persecuted. As Christians, they worship Jesus Christ as Savior, Kurios, and Lord. Uh, Excuse me, Savior, Soter, and Lord, Kurios. And Paul highlighted this in chapter 2, verse 20, where he wrote, For our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, Soter, the Lord, Kurios, Jesus Christ. 
But the Roman citizens of Philippi were proud of their citizenship. And they worshiped, among other gods, Caesar, who was specifically identified as Kurios, Lord, and Soter, Savior. And when a person became a Christian and valued their citizenship in heaven above their citizenship of Rome, and when they began worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ instead of Caesar, they were going completely counter to the culture in which they lived. And they were not popular. They became targets of opposition and persecution. Okay, Paul wrote this letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi. In verse 3, we see that he remembered them all. In verse 7, we see that he felt deeply for them all. And in verse 8, we read that he longed for them all. These people who, were, who Paul wrote to were saints. Saints. This moniker, saints, does not refer to someone who has been beatified by the Catholic Church to a higher than normal human status. No. No, the word means holy ones. And when a person becomes a true believer in Christ, he or she becomes a holy one, a saint. Someone who is set aside for God's use. Holy, separated set aside for God's use. Here and everywhere else in the New Testament, when you see the word saint, you can just simply replace it with the word Christian in meaning because saints refer to believers, Christians. Paul wrote to all the saints in Philippi, and I think it's interesting that he added, and this is the only place he added it in his introduction of all his letters, um, including or together with or along with the overseers and deacons. Notice that the saints, the overall assembly, is mentioned, are mentioned first, and the leaders, overseers and deacons, are mentioned second. Also notice that Paul does not place the leaders uh, above the saints. He places them after and alongside the saints. It's as if Paul wanted to emphasize that the church leaders are to be seen as part of the church, not uh, outside it and not over it. Now, just a little bit about church leadership in the New Testament. Overseers here, overseer, the word is episkopos, uh, root would be episkopos, is translated bishop in your King James Version, if you have that. It refers to, <clears throat> pardon me, an inspector, an overseer, a watcher, or a guardian. In 1 Peter 2.25, we see that Jesus Christ was referred to as the shepherd and guardian of our souls. This word guardian translates our word episkopos. In Acts 20, Paul func describes the functions or the work of the overseers or bishops. He said in verse 28 to the Ephesian church elders, which he had called to him, and we'll see that in a moment, um, he said to them, be on guard for yourselves, for all the flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, that's our word, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased, which he purchased with his own blood. Overseers guard the church, the flock, and they shepherd or provide pastoral care to the flock. The Greek word translated shepherd is pastor. As a verb, it's to pastor. As a noun, it's a pastor. Now look at verse 17 of the same passage where we see that from Miletus, Paul called to Ephesus 
called to him the elders of the church. And then he said these things, which included the verse we just read. Paul wanted to talk to the church leaders from Ephesus, and he called the elders. He said that they were overseers or bishops, and he told them to pastor the church. Elders, overseers, bishops, Jeff, and it's an inside joke. Okay. And pastors. In reference to a, a single church, all of these men, all of these names are synonyms that describe the same person, the same role, the same function in the church. These are men who are from within the church and not over it and not outside it. Also note that in Philippians, Paul was writing to a single church, 12 years old. Yet he spoke to more than one overseer. Single church, plural overseers. Does this indicate that there are several overseers, that there were several overseers in one church? I think it does. I think it does. It's true. It's true that this statement that we're looking at here is more of a description than a prescription. In other words, he's describing the church congregation with its leadership. He's not prescribing the way it ought to be. He described his audience. He did not prescribe that this is the appropriate church structure. Still, it opens the door for considering multiple men sharing the responsibility of church leadership in a single congregation. And by the way, this plurality of elders, overseers, bishops, and pastors, in reference to a single church, occurs at least four times in the New Testament. And if you want those passages, come see me. I have it in my notes. At our church, we have multiple leaders. We believe it's a biblical way to lead a church. We are not critical. We are not critical of people, of churches that have a single pastor. But we feel like we have complete biblical authority and permission to have multiple pastors in this church. So, Paul wrote to all the saints, including the overseers and deacons. Deacons are the men who are set aside to minister to the physical needs of the congregation. And in Acts chapter 6, where deacons were initiated, we see that the deacons there had the particular responsibility of distributing food to the needy people in Jerusalem uh, so that the apostles could minister the word of God and pray. Both of these titles, overseers and deacons, mark the only two church offices described in the New Testament that are available to us today. Apostles are described, but they're not available to us today because that, the definition of apostle can't be just met 1600, uh, 1960 years later from the time this is written. These men, deacons and elders, are to be spiritually qualified men who are not novices, who are recognized from among the congregation to perform specified tasks in the leadership and care of the church, and they exist alongside the church, inside the church, not over the church. That brings us to verse 2. We are making big progress. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the standard a greeting that Paul used in every one of his letter with some modification. For, uh, but, the, but these elements occur in every introduction, every greeting. And it's more than just a formality. This greeting is a condensed form of Paul's theology. His entire message was one of grace and peace. 
grace, the unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor of God, his saving work in Christ Jesus brings believers into peace, into harmonious relationships with God and with each other. Paul's opening grace note is heard again at the end of his letter. The last verse of the letter says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. He begins and ends with grace. And his opening greeting of peace is heard again in chapter 4, verse 7, which says, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And it occurs again in verse 9, where it says, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. Everything that Paul wrote in this letter can be set between the bookends of grace and peace. All of the outworking of salvation depends on God's gracious initiative to us. And all who totally rely upon God's grace will be guarded by his peace and enjoy the presence of the God of peace. Well, that's the introduction and overview of the book, of this letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church some 1960 years ago. And now in closing, and because this, like all Greco-Roman letters, were to be read out loud, I'd like to close by reading Paul's closing paragraph of his letter. Listen and enjoy. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In every and any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. And you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Every saint in Christ Jesus, greet them. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you now for the teaching of your word. We thank you for this letter, which was preserved for us, inspired by you through the pen of Saul, of Paul. It's content preserved, and now we have it in our hands. And we're grateful. We thank you so much for this. And we ask now that as we study this book in the coming months that you would open our eyes to see and behold wonderful things from your word, that you'd use your word to 
train us, to inspect us, to improve us as we walk in this world as your people. Remind us that we are citizens of heaven, that we belong to you, that you are our Lord and our Savior. May we walk about with this attitude in our hearts and this truth upon our lips, and we say it in Jesus' name. Amen.